good to have everybody here. So before we get started, I just, any quick questions from the floor about the Still tests? Gotcha. If you have your hand up, I'll answer your question and then we'll move on. Otherwise, if you have a test, just put it in this pile right here. Um, some of you are asking, can I get another test? The answer is yes, if they're there, but just take one. The reason why is I want to have enough for everybody. But if you want all the tests, all you have to do is ask me at robpopsley at gmail, and I'll email all the tests to you, and you can have them all and enjoy. The reason, and some of you were asking about the uh, scripture verse on the back, um, written, written like this. Some of them have them, some of them don't. But what I would do is, in my training with the students, there would be 10 blanks, and each blank was worth 10 points. If you get all 10, you get 100. You miss one, it's 90, two, 80, three, 70, A, B, C, D. If the kid didn't get it right, he would fail his what we call SMB, which is scripture memorization. And we usually tie in a scripture verse that was germane to the study, and that's how we did it. So that's why the students were able to memorize the scripture, which is important, amen? Anybody here for the first time today, your first timers, we wanna welcome you, God bless you all. And for those of you that didn't raise your hand, we noticed that. But we welcome you anyway. God bless you. Uh, uh, as far as speaking fast, I am Italian. You get it? Any Italians here? This is the uh, Midwest. Very good. We try not to offend, but we seem to seem to do it anyway. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I want you to know that I do watch every one of these classes to um, make sure that I'm tracking with you and I'm finding that I need to do a better job at answering your questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll work harder at that so you know. Okay, now before we get started, uh, we had a request two weeks ago that uh, if I can do a real brief explanation on the difference between exegesis and eisegesis. I put together a paper, it's a one page paper, if you want it, all you have to do is email me and I'll send it to you, okay? If I was really good, I would print these up. Maybe next week when you come, I'll have them printed up for you. That way, you'll be fine there. So I want to start with that, and then we're going to get into our study. Our text today is going to be Daniel chapter 12. We read it last week, and we'll begin. All right? I want to be open up the word of prayer and ask the blessing of the Lord. Father, we pray the blessing of God to be upon these wonderful people. Open our hearts and minds now to receive from you. Protect us. Give us favor. Help us, Lord Jesus, to listen to the voice of the Spirit. And we pray it so, Lord God, that as we do, that the word would come forth boldly in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Welcome. Okay, so I'm going to give you a real quick um, exegesis versus eisegesis. The first thing you've got to remember is the E is silent on eisegesis. A lot of times people try to spell it without the E, and it never really works. So I'm going to give you some little Rob Lee tricks. First of all, when you think of eisegesis, Think of an eye, okay? There's an eye right there. And it's looking right at you, okay? And the idea of this eye is, it's what I see the Bible saying. It's what I think it says. It's what I interpret it. That's called an eisegesis. And so what you're doing is, is you're reading into the text, reading into the text what you think it says. Eisegesis, okay? A lot of times pastors and teachers will read a passage of scripture and they'll interpret it based on something that they may have heard from somebody else and they just repeat it without really examining what it really says. So as teachers, and by the way, I wanna remind you, I'm training you guys as if you're all pastors and you're gonna go out and preach the gospel. That's not the mode of this class. For some people, this might go way over your head. I would just say for you, just enjoy the ride, okay? Because the bottom line is, even if you talk to one person in a coffee shop or a car wash or wherever, you want to make sure that you have the gospel in you to be able to give it an accurate interpretation. The Bible says to everyone who asks, you must give them an answer. And the answer we want to give them is the right answer. Amen? Amen. So that's why I'm doing this for you. So you have this training. Then we have the other word, exegesis. Think of the word exit. Reading out of the text what it actually says. So we have reading into eisegesis and reading out to exegesis. Okay, in other words, the word Jesus has nothing to do with Jesus with a J. Okay, it just is, is, the, is the, the word that we use to uh, interpolate what we're doing. Okay, 
So that's your quick Rob Lee crash course on the difference between exegete and isogete. So the question I would ask is, do you think Pastor Dennis can exegete the word correctly? And the answer should be yes, absolutely. I have enjoyed watching him on your YouTube channel before I came here. And then when I come here, I sit in the front row right because I think that's the best seat in the house without being too invasive. And I like the word. I love hearing the word. I enjoy the word. I like listening to preachers like Perry Stone and Jack Hibbs and, and other guys uh, and hearing God's word and it just refreshes my spirit. And every once in a while someone will say something and I'll go, oh, I don't know if I agree with that, but who cares what I think? What matters is, is that the word is being proclaimed in an accurate way. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, any comments or questions before we move on? Mm -hmm. All right, let's pick it up with Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. We read it last week, and I said to you something to the effect of, we'll pick up on that next week, or two weeks. Well, this is two weeks. So if I can get a reader to read Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, and we're going we're gonna to pick up right from there, if that's okay. Okay, what, you got to raise your hand so I can call on you. All right, there's a lady behind you, Brother uh, uh, brother Ken. She's better looking in than mine. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. Ma'am, what's your first name again? At the time. Yeah, real quick. Your name, your first name? Kathy. Kathy, that's right. we got two Kathys in this class now. All right. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay. At that time, Michael shall stand up. Great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting. Those who are wise shall shine at the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the boat until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. All right, thank you very much. We have plenty of seats that are open. Um, some people put purses and papers on their chairs next to them. Well, you need two. Um, maybe we can work with this lady here. She needs two seats. We can work with her. Somebody. I appreciate that. We got two over here in the front row. If you don't mind, brother Steve over here doesn't mind. See, there's this lady coming in. We got one over here. Two over here. Thank you. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. My wife is coming in. Okay. You guys look great. Hey. First of all, thank you very much, Kathy, for that read. We're going to talk about it. Okay, let me teach you a real trick. This is Tactical Leadership 101 from Rob Lee. Anytime you go to a church or a Sunday school class or any place, our tendency is to put stuff in the chair next to us. We do that for two reasons. Number one, it's convenient. But number two, we don't necessarily want somebody sitting right next to us. But here's the real reality. Okay? We're covered by the blood of Jesus. No virus is going to take us out. And if it does, it's because... Our time of appointment had come to an end, and we were going to step across the veil into eternity. So I would encourage you, as much as you can, is maybe put that under your chair so that that's open for the next guy to come in. Now, what I do when I go to new places is I'll walk up and I'll say, is this seat taken? It's usually in the front row. And I'm a big guy, so people will look at me and think, okay, do I want this guy sitting next to me? And you know, the truth is, it's really not taken. I have my stuff there, but... And sometimes I'll sit right next to the person. <laughs> I'm one of those guys. I'm not a creeper. I'm just a, a friendly guy. There's a difference here, okay? So I encourage you to think about that. All right? All right, let's break it down. Are you ready? Come on now. So what we got here, push the wrong button. That never is good for a guy like me. So what we got here is we have, uh, at that time, Michael shall stand up. Now, when you're teaching this, you need to know that this reference is the tribulation. And we know that because he explains it even more. We got two over here, brother. Up front, we got one right here next to uh, 
Right, okay, and the one over here. So we got plenty of seats. That's right. We're good, okay. So this is a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation ever to that time. Okay, so Michael is a warrior angel who battles in the heavenlies for the Lord. There's a reason why Michael stands up. There's a battle that's going to take place. And when you stand up, you're taking a defensive posture. That's how it works. Now, most people, when they fight, they fight on their feet. And if they lose, they end up on their bum. And bum is the word we use in Canada. So that's the word we're going to use here very, very much. So you need to know at that time is a specific time. Okay? And then he describes that time in the passage. It goes on to say, um, at that time... Your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. The book, this book, is a direct reference to what we would later identify as the Lamb's Book of Life. Does anybody know what the Lamb's Book of Life is here? Does anybody remember the days when we had phone books? Yes. Phone books. Big, thick books. And you open them up and you go to the yellow pages for business and the white pages for people. Does anybody remember the power team where they would rip phone books in half and stuff like that? Remember that? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Just trying to get a read on where you guys are at, you know? It's a direct reference to the Lamb's Book of Life where there's a record of the names of all those people who are saved. So, we sing a song, there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine, right? And it's written down when you come to faith, right? That's what we're taught. But the reality is we would learn later in the book of Revelation that... The Lamb's Book of Life contains the names of every single person who has ever lived on the face of the earth. And it's written in that book. And it stays in that book until the duration of their life is over. And the minute they die, the name either remains or it's blotted out. That's why Christ says, I will not blot out your name. Because we get this image of, okay, blotting it out. Oh, we're going to rewrite it. Up, oh, you backslid. Blot it out. Rewrite it. That's, that's not even good theology, and it doesn't work good in the script of a cartoon. So we need good theo here, okay? And what the Christ is saying to us, as long as you have breath in your lungs, as far as I'm concerned, you are saved by grace. But when you die and you don't have Christ, blot it out. Why? Because the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he's so serious about that that your name is staged until the day you die. And when you die, the decision is made. That's how it works. Now, how many people are glad that we're saved by grace through faith? Amen? Amen. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16 that the Spirit of the Lord bears witness with our spirit that we are saved. That's how we know. And not just saved, but we're, we're joint heirs with Christ Jesus. We know there's something waiting for us in, in glory. Hallelujah. Listen, we've all lost people. We know what it feels. We know how it feels to lose. But if they die in Christ, their name remains in the Lamb's Book of Life. The Lamb's Book of Life. Not just a book that records the names of everybody who ever lived, but those who have accepted Jesus Christ into their life as Lord and Savior. That's a great word. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I want to encourage you with that concept. Because otherwise you're, you're not going to be able to track with this too much. Let me give you a quote from Dr. Ken Johnson, who's one of my teachers. Dr. Ken Johnson says this, and I quote, he says, Daniel 12 describes the time of trouble. The time of trouble begins with the, the rescue and resurrection of believers. It occurs at that time, which refers to the end time mentioned in the previous chapter, which is Daniel chapter 11, okay? And in Daniel chapter 11, we see the rise and fall of the Antichrist, including his war with Egypt. This proves the time of trouble consists of the whole seven-year period. That's the argument that you're going to get from some of your students. It doesn't describe the whole seven-year period. They'll teach you that it comes only halfway through, not the whole time. And that's where mid-rapture mid people get their, their, their view. Daniel 12 records that Michael will stand up at the rapture resurrection will occur at the beginning of the time of the end. When you are reading and you're studying, you want to get an, an accurate interpretation of what this passage means. And so usually what will happen is it will interpret itself as we roll along. And I'm going to teach you to watch for that so that we get a really good uh, exegete of God's word. Okay? So we're talking about the rapture there, the rapture of the church. Okay, let's move on. 
The phrase, your people, your people, that she just read, used here, normally would refer to the Jews. Why? Because this was written in the Old Testament. The Jews, right? We're talking about Jewish people. Oy vey. But a secondary statement is made. This is the statement. Everyone who is found written in the book. The book. Now we got a whole new dynamic. Because we don't know about the Lamb's Book of Life until the New Testament, and more specifically, until John the Revelator in AD 95 writes about it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ himself is saying, write these things. The Christ himself is talking about this magnificent book in the kingdom of heaven. And so we know that he's referring to a group of people. So what happens here is it changes the descriptor to reveal another group of people who are also <coughs> referred to as your people, but whose names are found written in the book. Ladies and gentlemen, I should like to submit to you that he's referring to the New Testament church, the future New Testament church. He's talking about you, and he's talking about me, and we weren't even born yet. But he's referring to this group of people in the future. Now that's consistent if we're going to have a rapture in the future. That's consistent if at the time of the end, something very significant happens, like, say, the Messiah coming and giving his life on a cross for our sins, dying and then resurrecting again three days later. Does anybody know what today is, what kind of a Sunday it is today? Anybody? Palm, Palm, Palm Sunday. Sunday, that's right. They were waving palm branches, right? And so we call it Palm Sunday. We're celebrating the Christ coming into Jerusalem as prophesied by Zechariah and other prophets. It's a wonderful, wonderful testament. Amen? Amen? Then he says this. We also have a resurrection occurring. He says, those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, which refer to people who have died and are at this time being resurrected. So we have a resurrection we're talking about, right? We read on and we see something else. There are two resurrections referred to in the passage. The first one is the resurrection to everlasting life. This is what we call the rapture or resurrection. And the second one is referring to those to shame and everlasting contempt. This is known as the great white throne judgment. We call it the GWP, uh, GWT. And this judgment occurs at the end of time after Christ's millennial reign. I will explain that to you in a future study. But I'm just trying to give you a perspective that we have two separate judgments taking place. It's important that you understand this. To put it another way, and I'll, we'll explain this many times in this class, the judgment seat of Christ, also known as the Bema seat, B-E-M-A, Bema seat, is a judgment that will be, be bestowed upon all Christians, people whose names are in the Lamb's Book of Life and have remained in the Lamb's Book of Life upon death. That judgment is a judgment of rewards. In other words, all the stuff we didn't like that didn't really matter, that's just going to get burned up. But we ourselves shall be saved. Hallelujah. There's another judgment that takes place that Jesus talks about when he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. And he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me. That judgment is not the Bema seat. That judgment is the great white throne. And the reason why they're saying Lord, Lord, is because they've been suffering in hell for hundreds if not thousands of years thinking they were saved. And then they're brought before the, the judgment seat. God, what are you doing? I did this and this. And he explains, we never had a relationship. See, some people think that if they do the work of the Lord, they're saved. If that were true, then what Christ did on the cross for our sins would be no avail. We can't save ourselves. We need a Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And when we accept the Christ into our life as Lord and Savior, we are eligible for the Bema Seat Judgment. So you and I are recognizing that we are going to be saved to everlasting life. That's our goal. Amen? Hallelujah? So I want you to see this as we, as we break through this passage of Scripture. Very important. He says, people who are raptured or resurrected are judged at the Bema Seat. People who are resurrected from hell are judged at the great white throne, then cast into the lake of fire, which is the place of everlasting shame and contempt. Yes, sir, go ahead. I work out Okay, so he's the question for the for our camera. 
Thank you, brother. Is what about people who died during the tribulation? We call them trib saints. Okay, so here's where they go. The Bible is very clear. They go under the altar of the Lord in the, in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is how I explain it to junior high people. When you get raptured, you go to the Bema seat, and then you go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's partying, there's singing, there's dancing, there's celebration in honor of the Christ. And we're all a part of it. And it's a party, and it lasts for seven earth years. Who knows how long that is in heaven? The people who die during the tribulation that are saved, they've come to faith after the rapture. They realize, okay, I blew it. Jesus, forgive me. And then they get by a meteorite or whatever. They, they die. They don't go into hell because they're saved now. They go under the altar of the Lord where their souls are sequestered in a place. Now, we think altar of the Lord, what's that all about? Well, in the Old Testament, we see the, the description of the temple that God gave to Moses. But that temple was a replica of what is in heaven. Ark of the Covenant, Holy of Holies, all that. It's a replica. So the picture is that these souls are under the altar of the Lord in the kingdom of heaven. And they're crying out, How long, Lord, till you avenge us? Because, let's be honest, these guys are barely saved. They've not been refined and sanctified. They want vengeance. And they know the one who's going to give it to them. And you know what the Lord does? He honors their prayer and he renders vengeance. It's wonderful. That's where they go. And then when Christ returns in the second coming, they're resurrected from that place and return with us. Amen? That's for anybody here who has children, grandchildren, or people you know that you believe, based on their decisions and lifestyle, will probably not make the rapture that should happen in the next 10 minutes, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, is that what the Catholics would call purgatory? Okay, purgatory is a, is a doctrine of a demon. It's a completely separate issue. In a nutshell, because I don't want to get too far off track. Purgatory is, and if there's any Catholics here, recovered Catholics, I'm Italian, so we practically lived in Rome, you know what I'm saying? But what I'm saying is, is they created this make-believe place that as long as you cooperated with the, the, the church rules, you could go to this purgatory place and purge your sins. You'd suffer for a little while, and then you were good, and then you could go on into heaven. woo -hoo! And so they're thinking, well, wow, I, I could suffer for a little while. If I could party now and then I'll suffer a little bit, then I'm good to go. I think I can do that. And it's a lie from the pit. It's not true at all. Right. So doctrine of purgatory, doctrine of a demon. I'll put it to you another way if you want it straight up. If hell wasn't forever, it wouldn't do any good. And why? Because you and I are eternal creatures. We're going to live forever. One place or another. Amen? Back to you, brother. First name again. Aaron. Aaron. Yes, sir, go ahead. So the only other thing I wasn't sure about is see those things get judged. You said they get they get resurrected to be judged at the point of throne and the everlasting. Okay, for the for for the our tape here. Tape. Okay, Where am I from? In the eighties, thank you. All right. <laughs> for the recording here, thank you. <laughs> do the saints who are in the altar get judged? Yes, they do. It's inferred that everybody is judged. Okay, now we don't know exactly the parameters of it because it could be the same way they're judged at the Bema seat, and then instead of going into the marriage supper, they go into the altar. That could be their judgment. We don't know for sure, but we do know that they do get judged because Jesus is very clear to say that all will be judged. So they would fall into that category. Okay. So hopefully this is hope for people here who have kids or grandkids that maybe are adults that are a little wayward. This is hope for you. Amen? In the back, Ke Teresa. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, so we, we covered that already in a previous, but I'll just give it to you real quick so you have it. The dead in Christ rise first. Okay, where are they rising from? Paradise, a place in heaven in the presence of the Lord. They rise first, then we who are alive and remain are caught up together with them. We meet the Lord in the air, and together we will be with the Lord. That's the words of Jesus. So they're actually in paradise. Yes, physically. yes. Wait. They're in paradise they're waiting for the resurrection. That's right. So they're not to the marriage supper yet. No, no. But have they gone to the Venus? Okay, two theories on that. One is yes, they've already been judged and they're waiting. Number two is no. I kind of think no, but the Lord can do what he wants. But here's the bigger fish there. They will go to the Venus. The Bible is very clear on that. 
So whether they've already been there or they're gonna go, it will happen. So that's how that works. Everybody stands at the beam, okay? We have a lot of older people in this church, I've noticed. And I've been here and there's been four funerals and I've only been with you three and a half months. Which means that some of you guys are probably gonna die in the next 10 minutes. And so I don't wanna freak you out or anything. But this class should be an awesome class for you because you know I'm gonna shed this body and I'm gonna step into a new one that never fades away, amen? amen? And the trick of the devil is to get you all freaked out and scared and worried and oh no, I got the notice from the doctor. Hey listen folks, if you're old in this room, you lived a good life. You've seen some of the best years this nation has to offer. But you've not seen anything yet. I'm telling you, what's coming is coming. Define old. Old is anybody that's older than me. That's old. Okay? How do you define old? See how that works? How old are you? I am 56 years old, brother. I'm old, man. Well, I don't feel like a kid. But I'm working on it. So anyway, that should bring hope to you. Amen? We good? Hey, you know the truth is, folks? Medicine, doctors, procedures... We're, we're living longer. Let's face it. Yeah. We're living longer than we, you know, you, you go to the doctor, the doctor says, well, you got a little cancer, but no problem. We'll, we'll laser beam it off and you're good to go, you know, or we'll give you a procedure. My, my dad passed away at 81. He could have lived till he was 100. He just got tired of living. They gave him a whole new valve and all kinds of stuff, you know. It happens. But here's the good news. When you punch through the veil, you're in a new body. And I'm going to tell you, people often ask, what is that like? It's basically like walking through a door. You open the door, you walk through the door, you're in a new room. The room you're in is gonna be a room you're gonna be in forever. So if I can speak to people that might be a little freaked out about death, about dying, about what happens on the great beyond and all that. Listen, we have staked our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his word. His word is very clear, very clear about where we're going. This class speaks about where we're going. Listen, if I wasn't telling you the truth, the spirit of the Lord that's within you would be activated and say, that guy is teaching heresy. But there's something about what I'm saying that you know in your heart is true. And more importantly, you have to adjust to it. Not because I said it, but because it comes from God's word. It's important that we understand that. And that's why we need a really good exegete of God's word. And you all must exegete well. Amen? Amen. It could be a bumper sticker or a t-shirt. Or something you put on your bathroom wall. I don't know. I just got there. So, praise the Lord. Now, let's move on. I love these little rabbit trails. You guys are just students of God's word. All right. Then she read this. She said, those who are wise. That's what she said. These are believers who share the gospel of Jesus. And watch this. Turn many to righteousness. That's soul winners. Isn't that great? Soul winners. How many people have ever won somebody to Jesus? You welcome into welcome the kingdom of God. We were in California, and Peabob and I, we got to California. I dropped him off at his friend's house. I didn't see him until the end of the trip. He's doing his thing, and I'm doing my thing, which pretty much was working sun up to sundown, straight through. Praise God. Thank you very much for asking. <laughs> While he was out having fellowship with all these people, because he's Mr. Popular. He was the fun pastor. I was the pastor pastor, you know, so everybody liked him. It was kind of good cop. Bad cop, but anyway, he's, he, we have we have an affinity towards law enforcement. Uh, I mean, I was actually a police officer. He was in support of a lot of our details that we went out on, so we kind of have this, and so we kind of run with cops. There's this young cop, and he's dating one of our gals that we were raised, good-looking kid, you know, and he says, I've got everything. I've got a great job, a career. I have a beautiful girlfriend. I'm going to be a fiance. We're going to get married. I have a wonderful house. I have a good pay." I'm missing something, and he walks him through the sinner's prayer and leads that young officer to Jesus. He was so excited. Yes! Oh, I have it! Those who are wise shall bring many to righteous if they're winning souls for Jesus. <coughs> Listen, folks, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to win people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So if you're not won something to Jesus in a while, start, start here. Start with your family. Start with your marriage. Work your way out into your neighborhoods, into the community. Be the Christ. Love people. Amen? I get people are jerks, but let's be honest, so are you at times. Come on now. So we've got to be good stewards of this that we have. Amen? So I encourage you. That work for you? Woohoo! 
All right, so be wise. Lead them to the Christ. Lead them to the faith. Let's read on here. What do we got here? These people were once unrighteous and lost. Anybody here once unrighteous and lost? Anybody at all? Now, let's talk about some of your previous sins for the whole class. What do you say? Okay, very good. Okay, sorry. But watch this. Now we're saved. We're transformed. We've been turned because of the witness of the wise saints who shine like the brightness of the firmament. Somebody led you to Jesus. You're going to lead somebody to Jesus. They're going to lead somebody to Jesus. The righteous ones will live forever with Jesus. We're seeing the evangelical mandate being presented in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, as he looks through time into a future place where a person no longer has to have their sins atoned for by the, bloods of, the blood of animals and bulls, but through the shed blood of Jesus Christ by faith, they receive it by faith. That's the New Testament church. That's you and I. We've got to see this. It's wonderful. And we want to be those people who are wise. Solomon referenced the wise this way. Now, remember I talked to you about Scripture, always interpreting Scripture. This is a really good exegete here, okay? <clears throat> Proverbs 11.29. He who troubles his own house will inherit the wind, and the fool will be the servant of the wise. Okay, hopefully I'm not talking to anybody there, but if I am, we can work on that. Verse 30, watch this. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. See how that works? The scripture interprets scripture. That's Old Testament, just like where Daniel was. Solomon, Daniel, the same anointing of the Spirit. If the righteous will be recompensed or rewarded on the earth, how much more the ungodly and the sin? <clears throat> Which means that the righteous are going to get their reward, the wicked are going to get their reward. How many people know it's not the same reward? <laughs> and listen, you can be as rich as Rockefeller in this life, and the minute you step across the veil, you're as poor as a pauper, just like that. You gotta know the only way we can have it is through Christ. A great proverb there that brings it home. So here we see how the wise win souls and are rewarded, as are the wicked. Just a different reward. Daniel was commanded to keep the word secure until the time of the end. The time of the end is the phrase that he's using, and it refers to end times or last days. It's the time just prior to the rapture of the church, where we're going to start to see things happening and we're going to realize, whoa, something's going to happen. We know we're close, right? Usually that might be a span of 60, 70 years, even 80 years. But in our lifetime, we've seen it. We're wise. We're hip. We drink coffee. We're tactical, right? We can see something's up, all right? So people are going to travel to and fro and knowledge shall increase. In other words, we're talking about today. Today's the day, right? That's the picture. Now, for those of you guys like to argue a lot, you're always there, let's take a look at this. Some scholars teach that this is not referencing trains, planes, and automobiles. I'm sure you've heard this argument. Rather, technology, or technology, but rather a greater, deeper revelation and understanding of God's word to those who search it out. In other words, running to and fro is running to and fro in God's word, as opposed to running to and fro across the planet, like on an airplane, or in a submarine, or on a ship, or something. Okay, so because you have that argument out there, here's how I tell the students to, to deal with it, to argue, because you always want to have the argument. In either case, you can have it both ways. You can have a fast car, and you can have a better understanding of God's word. You can believe in both, as both are relevant to the text. So it's true, the Holy Spirit is bringing divine and new revelation to us. Not that it's new doctrine, but it's been there the whole time. He's just unveiling it to us. And why now? Because we're close to the end. We need the information now more than ever. But at the same time, I can take a picture of a check and deposit it into my bank account in L.A., but I'm here in Springfield. Or not in Springfield. I'm in Lee Summit. I keep saying Springfield. So. And you've been in the Assembly of God as long as I have. It just kind of rolls with it, you know? Or, or I can go to the doctor and have a procedure done that couldn't have been done five years ago. Or I can talk on the internet, or I can do whatever that I couldn't be done last week. I mean, it's happening so fast right before us. And you know what else is happening? We're seeing a great deception in the power brokers of our world, governors and presidents and leaders and communities, as people vote one way, but it goes another way because there are power brokers that are trying to institute their 
vision, their version of how they want this nation to look like. We see it. We've seen it for a long time. And we're going to do our best to defend our nation, but ultimately we belong to a kingdom whose builder and maker is God. And we know this. And we appreciate so much what our forefathers have established in this nation, but we belong to another nation that supersedes this nation. We must never forget that. Very important we understand that. So when you read this passage, you need to see it can go both ways. Right? In your arguments. Most of our Assembly of God churches hold to a pre-tribulation rapture view, uh, the position of our fellowship. You need to know this if you're going to be in the Assemblies of God. Some of our pastors have a different view than pre-trib. Okay, will a pastor lose his papers if he has a different view? The answer is no. Now, in the Southern Missouri District, I had to sign a paper that said, you will teach only pre-millennial doctrine. Pre-millennial. didn't say pre-rapture. Because pre-millennial could be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-wrath. You can teach that and be okay in this district. Okay? However, however, it's important that pastors have a strong understanding of what they believe. So whatever you believe, you must be able to teach it. See, anybody can parrot somebody else. But the minute somebody with half a brain challenging, why do you believe that? Where did you get that from? How did you interpretate that, interpret that scripture? You have to be able to give an answer to that. Okay? That's important we understand that. Sorry, it's the wife. I gotta stop. Pick up milk and eggs. <laughs> Just kidding, that was a joke. I don't know how to do that. Watch this. Contained in our position paper on the Blessed Hope, which is number 13 of the 16 fundamental truths is this statement. It's right in this little booklet. This is what it says. For the sinner, however, the rapture is anything but a blessed hope. To be left behind will involve indescribable suffering as God judges a rebellious and disobedient world. The statement supports a pre-tribulation rapture view. It's just the way it is. So you need to know what we believe as a system. You can believe something different if you want, but if you're going to teach in this system, if we're going to be a pastor in this system, this is what I teach our young pastors. You have to know what you believe when it comes to the rapture. Most of our churches not only don't know, but they don't teach it. It's just kind of out there. It's like, well, I don't really understand this. I want to talk about this. Even though we can look around and see, hey, there's things happening around us. We need some tactical information. So what I would say for you is do what I do. There's a lot of reputable teachers out there that are reputable. Now, there's some guys that aren't reputable, but they're reputable guys, and you can watch them, and you can get information that might help you. Now, is there more than eschatology? Absolutely. But there's also more than salvation, or there's more than expository teaching, or there's more than... You have to balance out your, your meal here. See how that works? We don't all want to just have lasagna or all just have salad. We've got to balance it out. And so Paul says, all things in moderation. So want to be good. But it's important that right now we have a really good tactical perspective about what's going on. Very important. And especially for folks that are getting older, this is becoming more and more important to you. I will tell you that my mother-in-law, before she passed away, God rest her soul, she was concerned about her own son. We've got to make sure he's saved. We've got to make sure he's saved. He said, Mom, you've done everything you can do. It's in the hands of the Lord now. But she didn't want to pass from this life with making sure her son was saved. I'm sure many of you here probably feel the same way. My mother-in-law, she was a godly woman. I loved her so much, I used to hassle her. Oh, highly inappropriate, the things I would do to this poor woman. But for some sick and twisted reason, she loved me more than her own daughter. I don't understand that. So, I was one of those, one of those son-in-laws. I really, really loved her a lot. And more importantly, I hassled her husband, my father-in-law, which she really enjoyed. So maybe when I get to know you guys better, I'll show some of the many inappropriate things that I used to do to these poor people. But anyway, long story short, she says to me, I want to go in the rapture. I want to go in the rapture. And I, if I pass away, I'm not going to go in the rapture. I said, Mom, what are you talking about? You're going to go in the rapture. As a matter of fact, you're going to go before all the rest of us if we're still alive. The Bible says the dead in Christ shall rise first. I know that. I just wanted to go before I died. That's all. <laughs> so I said, tell you what let's do. Let me take you out to a ramen place here in Gardena. We'll get you full of salt. 
you'll stroke out, and you'll go home. How's that sound? That way you have no recollection of dying. Does that sound like a good plan? So that's what we did. Ramen, stroke, home with Jesus. She's waiting for the resurrection. Amen? That was kind of sick, wasn't it? Yes, yeah. That's exactly what happened, though. She loved ramen. What can I say? What, what am I supposed to do? Say no? Come on now. Debbie and I had a policy that as old as you are right now, give them chocolate cake, you know? What do we care, right? Just kidding. We loved them all. But I will tell you this, though. She has the hope. She's with Jesus. She's with all those who have loved his appearing. She's in paradise right now in a brand new body. I remember one of the things she told me just before he left, she says, even though I'm 95 years old, she was like in her 90s, you know, I feel like I'm 18. This body, though, this body holds me back. I want to dance like a ballerina, but, ah, my femur cracks every time I stand up, you know? It protrudes out of my leg and gets blood everywhere. It's terrible, you know? You guys think this is pretty sick. And that's exactly what happened to this poor woman, you know? But it's okay. We had a really good carpet cleaning company, and we wrapped her up, and we got her in, she was fine. The point that I'm making is this. This woman loved Jesus. This woman's with Jesus, and this woman is soon to be resurrected first. So when we get raptured, I'm going to go, hey, mom, hey, you look good. The femurs are great, you know? She'll probably slap me and then give me a hug. That's probably what I deserve. The point that I'm making is that's what awaits us. And I feel like what the Spirit of God is telling me through the crazy and twisted and evil humor is that some of you guys are really upset. You're disturbed in your spirit about this thing called death that bothers you, and it shouldn't. If you're a born-again Christian with the Spirit of God within you, that should not be an issue for you. You need to step back and take an inventory of your situation. You need to say, you know what? I've lived a rich, full life. There's a fewer days ahead than are behind. I'm going to make these the best days I possibly can with the plumbing and body that I have. And we're going to do this, and we're going to do it well. Because we know that the Christ is just beyond the door and all those who have loved his appearing. That's our, that's our mandate. That's the thing that God's called us to. I want to encourage you with that. We have spent the last five classes talking about the rapture of the church, the blessed hope. You guys have had some really good teaching on this doctrine. You've been given some handouts. You've taken tests. You have been given perspectives, so you have a better understanding of what this thing is that is soon to befall the world. And for an event that takes place in one one hundredth of a second, we spend a lot of time talking about it. It's not so much the event as much as it's what leads up to the event and right after where we're going. That's what we should be excited about. If you want to have a really good read on the rapture, read Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Revelation 4, 1 starts with the rapture, shows you where we're at, 5 continues, and then by the time we get to 6, it's what's going on on the earth. So it's a really, really good uh, expose on where we're at. Now, different from the rapture of the church is the second coming of Jesus Christ. When you come to this class in two weeks, not next week, because next week is what? Does anybody know? <laughs> Easter. Or we like to call it Resurrection Sunday because Easter comes from the word Ashtar, which is a pagan god. And Easter eggs and all that hoopla, which is, people say tradition, all have pagan roots. Fine, thank you, but can I have the chocolate bunny? Anyway, thank you very much, okay? <laughs> Covered by grace, right? The point I'm making is Resurrection Sunday, and we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So because of that, uh, Pastor Dennis and the crew here will have a nice little breakfast for us. Can I encourage all of you to be at that breakfast, if you can? Come on out and have some pancakes. Get your blood sugar up where it needs to be, especially those of you with diabetes. You know what I'm talking about. Just kind of put some extra syrup on there, some butter for cholesterol freaks. The idea here is that we want to be able to celebrate with one another and enjoy one another. And then we want to go in and worship the Lord and celebrate the risenness of our Savior. Amen? So we won't be in here... We actually, we might be in here, but those tables will be set up. But in two weeks, when you come back to class, in two weeks, we're going to talk about the second coming of Jesus. The second coming of Jesus. That's different, because in the second coming of Jesus, you and I are coming back with the Christ. It's going to be a great ride. Amen? Okay, so with that, three minutes. Any questions? Now is your time. Okay, right here. What's your name, sir? Doug. Doug, go ahead. I've been taught that um, 
when the rapture takes place, the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the earth and you can pick it up. And that's what that's because that's why people won't be saved um, through the Holy Spirit. And the only way to be saved will be to martyr, be martyred during the, the tribulation period. So I think that argues for pre-tribulation rapture. But also, you mentioned two or three times about our kids, our grandkids, and things like that. I mean, the time is short where the Holy Spirit is going to one day be taken away from the earth, and the door is shut unless you want to be a martyr. Okay, that's a view. And for the for the for the tape, for the recording, he's saying, and what's what we call the Holy Spirit being removed completely is the theory, but it's not true, and multiple reasons why. Um, I can lead with that next week, but let me just give you a quick answer. When we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it's very clear that the restrainer is removed. The word restrainer identifies what the role of the Holy Spirit is doing at that time. And what he's describing is the Spirit of God living in the New Testament church. But the Spirit of God remains on the earth. He has to, because you and I cannot be saved except the Holy Spirit draw us to the Lord. That's clear in Scripture. So if you remove the Holy Spirit from the earth, nobody can be saved. So what pastors will do is they say, you better do it now. Because after you're going to have to die, they're going to cut your head off. You better get saved now. So it's kind of a manipulation. And it's kind of a cheap trick if you're into that band from the 70s. The point that I'm making is this. I want to help you to understand that just the restraining force of the Spirit is removed. You think it's bad now? Trust me, when we're gone and the Spirit of God's restraining force is gone, all heck is going to break loose. And I say heck because we have ladies in the room and we want to be respectful. Amen? Mm -hmm. So here's the deal. The 144,000 Jewish servants of God are going to be full of the Holy Ghost. <coughs> one, the Apostle Paul, one guy turned the world upside down. Can you imagine 144,000? The Spirit of God is within them. When people get saved, they're going to come to faith. And when they come to faith, it's because the Spirit of God Tim LaHaye says more people will be saved during the tribulation than all of Christendom combined, not without the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So the teaching is not good. But here's the good news. I have a great teaching that will, go, will cover that particular topic in a future session, but I wanted us to wet your whistle. Okay, with that, I'm going to pray for you. Stretch your hand forward. Those of you guys that are watching on YouTube, God bless you. Thank you for joining us. You can stretch your hand forward too, unless you're driving. Then just <laughs> don't stretch your hand forward. But Father, I pray the blessing of God to be upon these wonderful people. I speak it forth even now, the blessing of the Lord. God, give them divine revelation. Help them to know the Holy Spirit is within them. He's causing your word to come alive. I speak it forth for healing and divine intervention. Father, I speak it forth the work of the Spirit to be done, even in people's bodies that need a touch from the Master. I thank you for it. I bless them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of God. And all God's people said. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I'll see you in big church. We'll see you here in two weeks. God bless. Amen.